industrial revolution and slavery have been represented within museums and heritage sites. So I'm really pleased to be able to introduce our next um, set of speakers. Um, to begin with, we have Suzanne Seymour and Lisa Robinson. So Suzanne Seymour is Associate Professor in Geography at the University of Nottingham. Her research focuses on landscape and landed society in the 18th century and the histories and legacies of enslavement and colonialism in rural Britain. She's also director at the University of Nottingham's Institute for the Study of Slavery. So she's worked on numerous different heritage projects and community history projects, and she's going to be speaking about them today. And she's worked quite closely, well, very closely, <laughs> in partnership with Lisa Robinson, who's director of Nottingham-based um, social enterprise Bright Ideas, and she's also a PhD student at the University of Nottingham. She's led on several really amazing history and heritage projects, including slave trade legacies and legacy makers. So Suzanne and Lisa, I'm going to hand over to you for your presentation. Any problems with getting your slides working and we will switch to me presenting for you. Just let me know. Thanks, Kate. Um, I don't know, Lisa, are you here? Lisa, you'll need to unmute yourself. Uh, in order to be able to present. You've got presenting rights, so you just need to switch your camera on and unmute. There we go, Lisa, welcome. I think you've got me twice, actually. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let me, let me leave one of these and uh, there you go. How's that? Perfect. We can both see and hear you. Perfect. Brilliant. So I'm going to start the slides, hopefully. So I think you were kicking off, weren't you, Lisa? Yes, yeah, so um, thank you uh, for inviting us to speak today about um, our Global Cotton Connections uh, collaboration. Um, I'm Lisa. Um, as explained, I run a social enterprise called Bright Ideas Nottingham. Uh, and I've been very much involved with um, the Legacy Makers um, project, which was formerly called the Slave Trade Legacies. Um, so in this presentation, we'd like to tell you a little bit about the history, the purpose and achievements um, of that collaboration. Um, the collaboration is between University of Nottingham academics and the community group called Legacy Makers. And they are mainly from the African and African Caribbean um, communities, but not solely. And it's about our work in the Derwent Valley Mills World Heritage Site, which is a key site of Britain's industrial revolution. I will just say that we have had sugar related, um, we do work on sugar related uh, and other um, materials linked to the transatlantic trade as well, but this particular presentation is about the global cotton connections. Yeah, so we're just going to say a little bit about the, the background to the, the development of, of our collaboration, which began in 2014, so 10 years now. Um, for me, I, I was um, involved with a series of Arts and Humanities Research Council um, Connected Communities projects. Really, ones which had a rural and provincial focus, which set out to challenge the idea that Britain's links to enslavement were just in the major port cities. And, and so there were, there were three of them. And the first one, really, it was quite broad, but cotton came up as a, a focus in one of the scoping workshops. And that led on to the first of the Global Cotton Connections um, projects. Um, involving historical research and community-led interpretation. And then a third project where practicing reparative histories in rural heritage sites, where we focus much more on, on interpretation of materials in the Derwent Valley Mills World Heritage Site. So in 2014, um, we launched the Global Cotton Connections um, project in Nottingham at the uh, a large cultural venue, the Nottingham Contemporary, 
And what we did was we invited um, people from the African and African Caribbean communities in Nottingham to join us in the hope of recruiting volunteers for the project. Um, the purposes uh, of the project were to try to develop an understanding of Britain's um, connections to the transatlantic trade of African people, um, to influence um, or enhance the retelling or telling of these histories in heritage sites. And I think really critically to ensure that black descendants, uh, black descendant communities led the work on the project. So we always say that our work is academically driven, but community led. And um, as a result of the launch, we um, recruited about 40 volunteers, 25 people who have been involved in the work um, over the last 10 years. And bearing in mind, this was at the time when we launched just a one year pilot pro project. Um, so we've had a really high retention of uh, volunteers. Um, in fact, the main reason why uh, we've the lot lost the few that we have is unfortunately because they've passed on to the ancestors. So just showing here the uh, a, a slide of the uh, of of the Derwent Valley for the, for those of you who who don't know it, it's a, a long um, world heritage site covering a whole range of of mill sites from the mid to late eighteenth century, and it's recognised um, this area as as the site of the world's first successful water powered Scotland cotton spinning factory and our partners here uh, as well have included the world heritage site the arkwright society and we also work with sheffield based academics and community groups of, of south asian descent on two of the projects sorry so i skipped back there <laughs> um so I just want to say a, a, something about the historical research that was done um, as part of the first project and a key element, a key early element was to trace the origins of raw cotton supplied to the Derwent Valley Mills. And, and for this, we used the records of the, the Strutt family, who were very important um, mill uh, owning family in the area. And we, we actually worked to reinterpret some much older research that was undertaken in the 1950s. And so the map at the top with the colour on it shows the reinterpretation of, of that data, really just mapping out where the where most of the cotton um, that Fitton and Wadsworth identified coming into the Struts enterprise, where most of it came from. And we found un unsurprisingly, most of it came from the Americas, where it was being produced by enslaved people of African descent um, on, on plantations in, in what's now uh, Brazil, um, other parts of South America, the Caribbean and the southern states of America. And in the Caribbean, it did include quite a lot of cotton coming from this very small island of Cariacou in the late 1790s. And then we did our own analysis of the raw cotton supplies from the um, cotton ledger weights. Um, and the ledger is available in the Derbyshire Record Office. And we found a sort of similar pattern in the 1790s of by weight of cotton coming into uh, the Struts mills. I think this is you, Lisa. Yes, yeah. Um, so um, one of the things we th felt it was important to do was to actually visit the mills. Um, and that was to sort of develop an, an understanding of, of the histories. We did lots of educational um, activities, um, including visiting museums. We went to Liverpool, we went to the Wilberforce Museum, and we worked with the, um, with the UCL, the uh, database uh, people, to develop our understanding. But we also obviously had to, to visit um, the mills. And, and one of the things early on that we, we decided was to change the name of the programme, actually, um, from um, slave trade legacies to uh, legacy makers um, because obviously our, our ancestors were not slaves they were enslaved and there was a, a really important difference 
Um, so we speak of, you know, African people rather than slaves. Or um, What we wanted to do was to see if the sites acknowledge their links to the transatlantic trade and also to acknowledge how um, the material of uh, wealth of Britain has been built and if they did how they did and if they didn't to challenge them to do so. Um, and the other thing that we also did was uh, we've done over the last 10 years, um, in fact, is run a lot of co-production workshops. And as a result of that, um, we've produced textiles, films, poetry, song, all sorts of um, out cultural outputs. And we'll see how that um, developed on the Global Cotton Connections project at the, at the visitor site. Yeah, so as, as Lisa's indicated, the the Global Cotton Connections collaboration has influenced the content of the Derwent Valley Mills Visitor Centre at Cromford Mills, which was first opened in 2016. And you can see an illustration of a couple of the um, pieces um, put in in relation to telling where the raw cotton came from using maps. So the first map was quite small, installed in 2016, and then they, they decided to um, make a larger map and to show that information much more prominently and clearly. And, and we felt this was a really important achievement. Um, so this is the mapping of the data about the struts. We felt this was really important because when we first visited Cromford Mills in 2014, the volunteers were told that the raw cotton supplies just came on pack horse from Liverpool and there was no further information about where that raw cotton was coming from. That was the curtailed story about, about where cotton came from. So it's really important um, that the volunteers could see this, this change in the visitor centre. And the slide shows Jenny, one of the, the volunteers with, with the, the larger map. We also suggested the design for something that's come to be known as the Global Cotton Workers Mural. Um, so as a group, we suggested an, an, a graphic um, in which different workers connected with cotton and with very different statuses as workers could be integrated into this new visitor center. So it's never really an intention to do anything that focused on workers. But we, we provided some sort of information and the artist Brian Gallagher created what's what you can see here, the Global Cotton Workers Mural in, in black and white. And this won a Public Realm Professional World Illustration Award in 2016. However, our involvement came quite late in, in the development of the visitor centre and the layout changes made to incorporate the mural led to its partial obscuring behind a decorated glass panel. And you can see that in your in, in the um, slide on the right. Um, so there were illustrations on glass which obscure the mural. On the left, you can see the mural which you can view close up by going up a ramp. And as as the quote suggests, um, this was a, 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 a point of ongoing frustration and upset amongst the volunteers. And you can see the, the type of response this uh, partial obscuring um, led to from, from the groups and the sense of disappointment, um, which has been ongoing and only has very recently been partially addressed. So this is a photograph from just a few days ago showing uh, the removal of the decorations on the upper part of the glass to reveal a fuller view of the mural from the wider visitor centre. It's not ideal, but it's better than it was before. And I think this, this development over eight years um, taking eight years shows how long term work is needed to make um, incremental steps and just to keep pushing that the situation wasn't acceptable with how the mural was installed. And we've been supported in this initiative through the work of Sophie Campbell, who's doing a postdoctoral um, piece of work with the Arkwright Society this year. 
So um, in 2017, we were invited to co-produce uh, an additional panel for the visitor centre um, to talk about where the cotton came from. Um, and we called our contribution uh, Ancestors Voices. Uh, it included historical images, which were chosen by the volunteers, and includes a map of Karakou uh, from Karakou Museum. Uh, we have co-written co texts, um, creative visual materials, and uh, recorded reflections as well. Um, and in the in the audio um, uh, content, we have ancestors' voices derived from historical narratives, uh, which were written by enslaved people. Um, there's songs and poetry, and one volunteer um, recorded why she joined um, the, the project. Um, and these developments were shared in a discovery day um, at Durham Valley Mills World Heritage Site, which was obviously open to the public. Um, in 2019 to 2022, um, legacy makers uh, were funded again by the um, Heritage Lottery Fund. So when we launched, um, we were funded by the Heritage Lottery Fund, um, but in between we've had little bits and bobs of money and often just been um, going from our own sort of motivation and, and passion and uh, voluntary efforts. But uh, we had a significant um, amount of money from uh, Heritage Lottery in 2019 to 22. Uh, this linked with the 200 year anniversary of St. Matthew's Church in Darley Abbey. So we worked quite closely with them. Um, that church was built by the mill owning Evans family. Um, and the project uh, expanded really to consider uh, mill workers. Um, last year, in 2023, um, we, um, after designing an, in, an information board, um, the legacy makers launched or helped launch uh, the information board at uh, Dali uh, Abbey uh, Mill and Village. Uh, so it's one of many interpretation boards, which is part of the um, Durham Valley Mills World Heritage Site path, um, way, I think it's the wayfinding scheme. Um, which um, the Global Cotton Connection project um, feeds into, uh, fed into uh, more widely. And I think our final comment will be where, where legacy makers are now. Um, during lockdown, sculptor Rachel Carter became involved with the Legacy Makers project. Um, her ancestors had, had worked at Darley Abbey Mill. And this involvement stimulated the Standing in This Place project, um, which is a collaboration between Rachel and the Legacy Makers volunteers. And the project has developed and raised funds for a new sculpture commemorating the contributions of two groups of women, enslaved cotton plantation um, labourers and cotton mill workers and their contribution to the East Midlands textile industry. And this full size version of her sculpture will be installed in the new Greenheart redevelopment of Nottingham's Broadmarsh Centre later this year. So I'm just aware we're a bit over time, but just to flash up the last two slides to highlight the ways in which the the, the projects have been recognised by the National Lottery Heritage Awards. They were finalists in the 2016 awards by the University of Nottingham, a long-standing volunteer award for the group, and um, as a case study in the AHRC Common Cause project. Thank you for listening. And thank you so much for presenting. Um, this is a project that I have had so much admiration for over the years. I was really pleased that you, you know, agreed to come and present because I also think it is a really important example of the ways in which these histories may have been neglected to some degree, um, you know, in academic history, but actually black history groups, community historians have been doing this work and continue to do this work. So it's really important that it's represented. So thank you very much for um, allowing us to see 
all that hard work you've put in because I was there were some updates there that I hadn't heard of as well so you know it's brilliant to see the work continue so um pop your questions in the chat for um Suzanne and uh for Lisa and we are going to move on to the next presentation now um which is with <laughs> Katie uh Vidal Belshaw I hope that's how I pronounce your name and apologies um if not, who is Senior Curator of Industrial Heritage at the Museum of Science and Industry in Manchester. She's responsible for the research and interpretation of the Industrial Heritage Collection and its globally significant uh, historic site. She's led on the Global Threads Project, which is a partnership with the Centre for the Study of the Legacies of British Slavery at UCL. And she's going to be joined by Megan Bridgeland, who's a PhD student at the Centre for the History of Science, Technology and Medicine at the University of Manchester, exploring the emergence of modern neurosurgery in the UK. And she was a researcher on the Global Threads Project. So I um, hope Megan and Katie are you are you able to unmute yourselves? You definitely got your cameras on, uh, and I will take charge of your presentation. So you just let me know uh, when I'm to move the slides on. So Thank I'm you, Katie. going to share the screen now. And you should be set to go. That looks fab. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thanks very much, Katie. So, um, hi everyone. Um, as Katie said, I'm senior curator at the Science and Industry Museum in Manchester, um, and I'm one of the co-leads of the Global Threads Public History Project. Um, and I'm joined in this presentation by Megan. Um, today, we're going to take you through um, some insights from the project. So, we'll cover a bit about the context of the work. Um, our approach to kind of some of the research um, and then a bit about the resources and the interpretation that we generated uh, and then just some thoughts about the um, kind of impact and some of the benefits of our project. So what is Global Threads? Uh, well, Global Threads is a public history collaboration. Uh, we're based in Manchester um, and it's led by the Centre of the Study of the Legacies of British Slavery at UCL. Uh, the Science and Industry Museum in Manchester and a team of emerging researchers. And our project aims to generate fresh understanding uh, and dialogue really about Manchester's industrial history and heritage, particularly its textiles industry, through original research that draws out new and underrepresented stories about the city's connections to colonialism, enslavement and global movements of people and goods. And our project brings together histories of individuals, locations, museum collections, weaving together sources to reveal stories that connect Manchester and its industrial history to people and places around the world, uh, around the cross-cutting themes of labour, exploitation, resistance and solidarity. And what Global Threads also sets out to do is to, I suppose, generate new approaches to public history research and interpretation. So really at the heart of our project is our team of emerging researchers uh, and for us collaboration, skills development and the sharing of diverse perspectives are really central to the ways that we work. Uh, and we think this approach is really integral to the quality of the project's outputs. Uh, so a bit about the Science and Industry Museum. We are a national museum uh, based in Manchester. And we have collections covering about 200 years of scientific and industrial developments uh, from the Industrial Revolution up to the present day. And um, we receive about 600,000 visitors a year, and that includes almost 40,000 school visits. And one of the museum's most significant collections, and you can see some of them pictured up here on this slide, uh, relates to Manchester, the Manchester region's uh, cotton industry, uh, and highlights of which uh, are displayed in the museum's textiles gallery. And this has already been covered today, but in the late 18th and 19th centuries, the mechanisation of cotton manufacturing really put Manchester at the centre of international networks of agriculture, manufacturing and trade, which relied really heavily on enslaved labour and colonial systems. The demand for cotton goods as part of the transatlantic trade in enslaved Africans played a significant role in stimulating the early growth of Manchester's textiles industry. So in 1788, Manchester's annual exports of textiles 
to Africa were estimated to be worth about 200,000. That's about 24 million today. Uh, and then by 1860, uh, almost 90% of the cotton being processed in the region's mills was grown by enslaved people in the southern United States. But the Science and Industry Museum, I think like most museums with industrial collections, and this has already come up today as well, has historically not prioritised these narratives about the importance of slavery to industrialisation. I think as a sector, industrial museums haven't recognised these connections or, or perhaps more likely they've chosen to leave out these kind of stories from their interpretation. And instead, uh, the sectors tended to focus overwhelmingly really on stories of technological innovation, transport revolutions, British inventiveness and kind of local contributions and impacts. Uh, and at best have tended to treat slavery as a kind of minor point that's separated out from the wider story they want to present about Britain's industrial development. And this has continued really despite decades of activism and a growing scholarship that has demonstrated the connections between industrialization and slavery. Uh, next slide, please, Katie. So back in 2018, um, I began working on a refresh of the museum's textiles gallery uh, and at the time histories of enslavement weren't represented in the existing displays. So as a curator looking to address this, I had lots of questions about what the museum's approach to researching and sharing these histories could or should look like. Um, and I've summarised these here. Uh, so how do we embed these stories as part of the core narrative of Manchester's industrial history, not something that's separated out from the wider story? How can we draw out stories that centre the lived experiences of people whose lives were shaped by enslavement? How do we present diverse perspectives about these histories and their legacies? How can we work in an equitable and reparative way to research and share them? And how do we make these histories relatable to audiences when they can seem overwhelming in terms of distance and time and complexity uh, and when they deal with these difficult, often distressing and at the same time um, contested histories? So the museum's partnership with the UCL Centre for the Study of the Legacies of British Slavery and our resulting Global Threads collaboration really emerged within this context. Uh, back in 2019 and we set out to try and address some of these issues and challenges uh, both through uh, our ways of working and through the team's research and outputs. Uh, next slide please. So we initially recruited through an open call a team of seven researchers, all current or recent postgraduate students from a range of disciplines and from diverse backgrounds. And this mix of skills and perspectives really enriched the Global Threads project. So supported by a briefing pack and introductory sessions, each researcher pitched to deliver one or two fully paid case studies, which we then went on to commission. And once the researchers work got underway, we delivered research and writing workshops, sharing and feedback sessions. Uh, and these really provided opportunities to share ideas and perspectives on the emerging research identify relevant sources or collections and work through questions and challenges together. Next slide, please. So the result of this first phase of work, um, as you can see on this slide, uh, this is a screenshot from our website. It's a set of 10 diverse but in interconnected case studies, uh, which range across the full duration of Manchester's cotton economy. And each one of these draws out a particular global thread uh, that's linked to that history and they connect individual people, places, sources and museum collections uh, around the themes of labour, exploitation, resistance and solidarity. Uh, so there's a real range of case studies, um, case studies centering the lived experiences of enslaved people on cotton plantations that are linked to Manchester manufacturers, to research that un uncovers the connections between Manchester mill workers and African-American anti-slavery campaigners who visited the city. Uh, and taken together, uh, the research presents a kind of interwoven global narrative about Manchester's textiles industry. And crucially, each individual case study or global thread helps us to open up a, a window onto these big, complex and often challenging themes around colonialism and enslavement uh, using a range of sources and material culture. The, the research is all presented in human and relatable ways 
uh, centre the voices of those whose perspectives have not typically been present in histories of industrialisation, including the enslaved. Next slide, please, Katie. So since the first phase of the project back in 2020, uh, it's continued to grow. The team have since delivered public facing engagement activities in the museum. They've spoken at conferences and they've been commissioned by the British Textile Biennial to research and curate content. Uh, some of the team are currently working on a project with Manchester Art Gallery uh, and four new case studies have just been published to the website. Um, and on that note, I'll hand over to Megan to give you more of an insight into the project's research and outputs. Hi, um, could I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, I'm Megan and I'm in the first year of my PhD in the history of neurosurgery at the University of Manchester. Uh, when I first became involved with the Global Threads project, I was partway into my master's degree in the history of science, technology and medicine, also at Manchester. I'm really interested in social history and both drawing out and promoting underexplored stories from the past. Coming from a science background, however, I didn't have much experience working with primary historical sources before this project. Being a part of Global Threads has not only allowed me to develop the research skills that have been key to my transition into a history PhD, but also contribute to several exhibitions and activity days that have allowed us to engage the public with these important narratives. I've been involved with several stages of Global Threads work from the start. Most of my research is focused on highlighting the lived experiences of enslaved people and framing this around Manchester's links to slavery and the cotton and sugar industries. Today I'm going to run through how the themes of culture, expression and resistance have uh, I've run through several of my contributions to this project. As the following examples will demonstrate, our approach to this research has been to weave together both broad industrial histories and much more focused personal and individual narratives. This enables audiences to engage with and relate to these complex, vast scale histories of industrialization, colonization and slavery. Next slide, please. Uh, one of my initial case studies explored the links between Manchester's cotton industry and the crafts and handiwork produced by enslaved people in the Americas. As our project is based in Manchester, textiles have been an important tool for us to draw out global connections and lived experiences throughout our research. They're also a really useful medium through which to connect with and engage the public. Beginning at a local level, this case study reflected on Manchester's rapidly expanding industry and its links to plantations across the Atlantic. For instance, established in 1795, the Spinners McConnell and Kennedy Co. rose to become one of Manchester's largest employers in just a couple of decades. Their business archive, which is held at John Ryland's Library in Manchester, reveals that much of their raw cotton supplies were cultivated by enslaved people in the southern United States, specifically the Sea Islands. The expansion of the textiles industry was based on this intensified commoditization across the globe of materials, land, labour, time and the bodies of enslaved people. Jumping off this link to enslaved labour in the southern United States, which the archive revealed, the rest of my research moved away from Manchester to focus on the way that enslaved people reclaimed textiles through non-industrial handicrafts and expertise as tools for self-expression, resistance and the preservation of cultural heritage. In this way, I was able to tell stories about textiles that centred the lived experiences of enslaved people as a counterpoint to the narrative of exploitation through industrial cotton manufacturing in Manchester. Next slide, please. Um, one example from my research looks at the rich history of quilting as a folk craft in the southern US. Here, enslaved people usually had to weave and sew their own fabrics from cotton. In addition to gruelling plantation work, these domestic chores were generally the responsibility of women. Filled with any small scraps of fabric or thread, quilts were needed to keep families warm throughout the chilly nights. However, they were often decorated with intricate designs made possible through the collection and trading of materials. Nighttime being the only opportunity they had to do work for themselves and their families, enslaved women used these exhausting shifts as a chance to bond, socialise and share quilting techniques. Unfortunately, due to fire, theft, loss and general wear and tear, there were very few enslaved women's quilts remaining. The most well-known enslaved quilter is Harriet Powers. Produced after she was freed from slavery, her pictorial quilt, which you can see on the screen, shows evidence of the traditional West African quilting techniques of applique and storytelling. 
This example highlights how knowledge and skills were transplanted across the Atlantic as African people were enslaved and transported to the Americas. Enslaved communities held onto and passed down cultural traditions as a means for survival, but also as a way to express their heritage and resist the attempts of planters to enforce uniformity and erase personhood and identity. Next slide, please. The preservation and sharing of these objects makes history and past lives tangible and relatable for visitors and readers. This was made particularly th clear through the next stages of our project. Drawing on our case studies, a group of us developed a series of activities to share and reflect upon our research with visitors to the Science and Industry Museum. In addition to various map-based activities, which highlighted the global nature of exploitation through textiles production, both past and present, and the opportunity for visitors to try out machine knitting with the talented Green Jay Crafts. One of our activities drew from the research on quilting and crafts. Next slide, please. Uh, with textiles laid out for inspiration, we asked visitors to draw an image, pattern or unique design that meant something to them to contribute to our collaborative patchwork quilt. Visitors of all ages enjoyed the creativity and in the end we collected and displayed hundreds of images. This activity also gave us the opportunity to sit with slightly older groups and engage in more in-depth conversations about the history of the cotton industry and slavery. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Uh, most recently, Global Threads was asked to collaborate with the British Textile Biennial uh, on an exhibition exploring the Pennine textile industry. At the heart of this project was a tiny fragment of Penniston cloth found amongst papers at the Derbyshire Record Office. As has already been mentioned today, in contrast to the southern US, significant amounts of cheap, low quality materials were imported to the British Caribbean to clothe enslaved people. Penniston, which is a type of coarse, heavy wool, was a common choice. The poor quality of these materials means that it's extraordinary that a sample has managed to survive for so long. This specific material was destined for Turner's Hall Plantation in Barbados. Our part in the exhibition lay in producing a timeline with key dates that link the fragment of cloth to a broad, broader global narrative of industry, colonisation, slavery and resistance. This and the fabric were accompanied by an incredible light installation produced by Illuminos, which was designed with these events in mind and projected on the ceiling. Uh, next slide, please. And um, finally, this work led to the development of a new series of case studies, the majority of which focused on Penniston cloth, Turner's Hall plantation, and the lives of just a few of the millions who wore this fabric daily. By uncovering references to ordinary items such as Penniston, we can reveal vivid insights into the experiences of enslaved and later apprentice people in the British colonies. These sources not only highlight the brutality of the system sustaining Britain's booming industries, but to also exemplify how enslaved people made creative use of extremely limited resources. Next slide, please. Hopefully these examples have demonstrated how we've used diverse source materials to draw together complicated global narratives in an engaging and tangible way for public audiences. While I've focused here on textiles, creativity and resistance as key themes to tie these stories together, this is just one route that can be taken. I'll pass back to Katie now to close with some reflections on the impact of our project. Thank you. Thanks, Megan. If we just have the next slide, please, Katie. So the research produced by the Global Threads teams had a major impact really at the Science and Industry Museum. Uh, it shaped new displays in several of our permanent galleries. Uh, so, for example, our introductory gallery, uh, Revolution Manchester, has been updated to feature research carried out by the team into Manchester Cotton Spinners, McConnell and Kennedy, uh, as described by Megan and into African-American anti-slavery campaigner Sarah Parker Ramon's visit to Manchester, uh, which was one of the themes researched by another team member. Uh, next slide, please. And the museum's textiles gallery now features research carried out by the team into anti-slavery campaigner Frederick Douglass's time in Manchester, uh, as well as objects and stories about the lives of people enslaved on plantations in the southern United States. Uh, and the displays also reflect on the ongoing legacies of these histories uh, in the world we live in today. Uh, and this was something that many of our Global Threads researchers also chose to do in their case studies. Um, 
The works also inform the development of a new script for our much loved daily historic working textile machinery demonstrations, which focuses on revealing stories about colonialism and enslavement connected to Manchester's textiles industry. And this is a really big shift for the museum, which has never had a demonstration covering these themes before. Uh, previously, uh, demos have always focused on technology of the machines uh, and the experiences of mill workers. So uh, this is something really new uh, for us. Uh, and all of this museum interpretation really reflects the Global Threads approach to research uh, in that re it reveals complex narratives about enslavement and exploitation by presenting tangible, relatable human stories uh, and prioritises narratives and sources and objects that centre the lives and perspectives of the people who experienced and resisted enslavement. Next slide, please. And I think the project's also demonstrating the value that this sort of mutually beneficial partnership work brings to the research and interpretation of histories of, of enslavement. We believe that building opportunities to work in equitable and reparative ways with diverse groups of emerging or community researchers uh, into standard and ongoing practice, uh, particularly for projects that inform major gallery developments, uh, should be cr a crucial dimension of heritage projects exploring histories of enslavement. Next slide, please. So I'll just close uh, by saying that Global Threads is an ongoing project uh, and our aim is that it continues to grow both as a publicly accessible bank of resources, uh, but also as a set of principles for research and heritage interpretation, which I've tried to summarise on this slide uh, that can really inspire further work to address how we understand and share stories about the cent centrality of enslavement to British industrialisation. Thank you very much.